What's going on today, guys? Welcome back to the first episode of Music Production Hot Takes. Uh, I asked you guys to send me your music production hot takes on my Twitter, Instagram, and my YouTube community posts. If you guys want to send in your stuff for the next one, follow my Twitter or Instagram. I may be splitting this up into two videos because I actually got a lot more responses than I thought I would. I actually thought I was going to struggle to have enough for one video, but we got at least 40 or 50 here, and I'm going to try to go through all of them. I'm going to start with the YouTube community post and work my way outward from there. All right, first we got here from uh, Kilo Eve. Music can be both loud and dynamic. Snake Eyes by Faint and Flower Wilderness by Camellia both have 18 decibels of dynamic range and are negative 7 LUFS integrated. You think negative 7 LUFS is loud? Those are rookie numbers, man. Yes, this is true. Music can be loud and dynamic at the same time. Uh, you can have something quiet and have something loud in the same song. Um, it depends which parts of the song are loud and which parts are dynamic. Also, it depends how you approach it too. Clipping is a great way to get things loud and volume automation is also a great way to help preserve dynamics or to have a bigger range between the loud and quiet parts. One thing also worth noting too though is that too much dynamics can actually be a bad thing. I don't know if you've ever watched a movie before where like sometimes it's way too loud and way too quiet, but I personally don't like having to tweak the volume knob myself while I'm watching a movie or listening to a song. So, you know, no dynamics is bad, and too much dynamics is also bad. Two-parter here. He said, Reaper is a gift that keeps on giving 99% of the time. They don't call it a rapid environment for nothing, do they? I have very mixed opinions about Reaper. Um, on one hand, it has a lot of great scripts and has a lot of great utility to it. On the other hand, I really hate the UI to it. I actually made a beat in it before. I know that's not what it's for. Uh, I made a beat in it and I got roasted in that video. Of Holy shit. Yeah, people people who use Reaper, they were not happy with that. They, they do not like when people do not understand the software. Okay, I got this take kind of a lot here. Jesus Pineda, Pineda, hopefully I said that correctly. He says, even the best mixing and mastering won't make a shitty song better. Most people will be humming to the music. I guarantee a catchy song will still be catchy, even if it's not finely mixed. As long as it connects with anyone, then that's great. While this is true for the most part, the, the songwriting does matter more than mixing and mastering. The mixing and mastering can also get in the way if it's that bad. You can have okay mixing with great songwriting and that'll be fine. But if you have a good song with the worst mixing ever, like let's say the vocals are way too quiet or the vocals aren't tuned up and they sound out of key, obviously things can get in the way to ruin a song. It's not such a binary issue. I also think it depends on the genre a bit too. Uh, I notice electronic genres, they require much better mixing in order for the song to succeed, especially something like dubstep, any sort of bass music. If the mixing is bad, no one's rocking with that song. But I do agree, the songwriting is more important. I just wouldn't not mix things. But you don't need to have a perfectly mixed song for people to enjoy it. All right, C3 Corp says, auditioning your mix and master on a variety of different sources, Bluetooth speakers, internal phone speakers, car systems, etc., enables you to make better mixing decisions and see how your track will perform in the real world. So this isn't really a hot take. This is just something they tell you to do if you go to audio engineering school. And that's because of the frequency response of whatever you're, whatever you're listening to on. I like to check in a variety of different things as well. I have two different monitor systems, one with a subwoofer, one without one. And that's so I can hear how the bass sounds with and without it, without having to do any sort of weird EQ tricks. I have these like shitty $20 speakers that I use also. And I also check on headphones. I check on basically like four or five different things. When you do this sort of thing, you don't want to let one of them totally affect your decision in the mixing process. You want to like use a balance between all of them. You know, if you hear the bass on one thing, but not on the other, then maybe you need to do something to the bass a little bit to try to get it so it works in both situations. Lethargic says, side chaining is overused. I'd rather my kick and to be in phase. Okay, so the side chaining debate here. I almost feel like I can make a whole video on this alone. I'm honestly not the most aware when it comes to the, the phase issue. I don't know if that matters a whole lot, unless it's like out of phase to the point where they cancel each other out. I do think a lot of people do over side chain when they're doing the kick and bass trick. Uh, I don't think you want to like set it to 100%. Like I, I also think this isn't a completely binary issue e either. You can like have it side chaining it like 30% or you can have a dynamic EQ and have it only ducking a little bit from your kick to your bass. It doesn't have to be completely canceling out the sound, you know? I do think sometimes it's overused and I also do not subscribe to Kenny Beat's philosophy of not doing the side chain. I'm more in the middle. I do, sometimes I do a little bit, sometimes I do like a good amount. Simpler is not better. Complex beats will outperform simple ones in almost every case. It's just about using complex things sparingly. Okay, it depends what we're talking about here. 
Uh, if we're talking about like a beat for someone to do vocals to, you know, simpler sometimes is better because you're giving them more room to work with. And, and I, you are right when you say that complex things can work if you use them sparingly. And then three, push your track into a limiter clip until it starts having negative effects, draw it back a bit. And that's basically all you need for loudness on trap beats. Like obviously, that's that's pretty much how you set a limiter or a clipper. Not really much else to say about that. I just I just agree with that one. And obviously, you can get more loudness mileage by adding a compressor or using a combination of clipping and maximizing, which is usually what I'd like to do. Okay, then Wool Ghost writes, "This is not my hot take, but my friends. I'd rather have the digital thing over the real thing in VST format. At least the modulation controls are more accessible and easy to man manipulate on PC." And he said he agrees on some of those aspects. I'm assuming he's talking about synthesizers, and if that's the case, then um, I kind of agree too. It really depends on the sort of space you have and how you like to work. I think a lot of times when you buy a piece of hardware, you're not actually, I mean, you can be buying it a little bit for the sound, but the sound is not going to make or break your music. You're actually buying it for like the workflow. Like if you like to work in that sort of way, you know, you might actually enjoy it more. You might have more fun doing that that way. Um, I really don't think the sound is like that crazier though. You know, if you play the same melody on an analog synth and on the VST, I don't think the analog synth people are suddenly going to be like, whoa, this is a good song now. No, they're not. They're just going to be like, oh, it sounds a little different. I do agree in the sense that I don't have space in here. Well, I do in this massive studio here <clears throat> or in my mansion. I don't have space for a bunch of hardware synths. Or, or pretty much any sort of hardware. So I pretty much work in the box for the most part. So I totally get where you're coming from. So I got I got a hole in my hand right now. I was talking shit about some guy's plug-in. We all know who. And then um, he beat the crap out of me and nailed me to a cross. So um, yeah, I've got a hole in my hand right now. Damn you, smile. But yeah, I also agree it is more easy to manipulate like modulation settings or to like program things with uh, software. All right, California J writes, Apple earphones are some of the most slept on in terms of music production. I feel like this is kind of related to the listening to your track on different things. There's definitely problems with only mixing and mastering on Apple earphones though. You're not gonna be able to hear low frequencies, so you won't know if you have too much low frequencies just by listening to it. So I don't know, it's it's hit or miss depending on what you're talking about here. Uh, hot take, real instruments are better than virtual instruments, especially flutes. I think some instruments are easier to replicate than other ones. For instance, a guitar is a lot harder to replicate than a piano in terms of like when you have the sample and you're playing it back. Uh, guitar has a lot more nuances to the way it's expressed. I do think it generally sounds better and more authentic though. So I do agree with that. So while I do agree with this for like real instruments, uh, I don't really agree with this for synthesizers because they're all electronics to begin with. All right, then we have a completely different opinion here. Bad Boy says, mixing is everything. You know, I, I feel like, it, like I said, I, this could be kind of true for electronic genres, but it's not gonna make or break the song. Good mixing will not save shit. Uh, if the song is dumb and it's about uh, butts, well, there's actually good songs about butts. Uh, Q, drill your cheeks. Uh, Rob, I almost called him Sam. I just want to drill your cheeks. No, not in love with you. Okay, do we have so many contradicting opinions here? All right, heavy side chaining on an 808 sounds better than leveling or subtle. I think heavy side chaining on 808 can sound kind of fucked up, so I'm gonna disagree with that one there. Uh, Switch Major says, being independent will work against you in the long run. It sounds appealing, but ultimately you will have more success if you're assigned to a label as connections and manpower to grow your brand. You just need to have a lawyer on speed dial to navigate bullshitters. I mean, do you have experience with this? I honestly think being independent is kind of better because you don't, have to worry well you have to worry about getting traction obviously but you get to keep all the money well i don't know you know it's there's definitely pros and cons to both because there's less to worry about when it comes to like legal things uh, you said get a lawyer but getting a lawyer doesn't mean you have less to worry about legal things it just means that someone else is gonna be worrying about it and then in turn you're probably gonna have to worry about it too and then you're gonna have to pay them money so you're gonna worry about the money also too being independent it, you know there's though no, there's no pressure no one's pressuring you to do anything. You can do anything you want. The label's not going to tell you you can't put this track out or you can't put this track out yet. You can do anything you want. I don't know. I, there's definitely pros and cons, but there's definitely also predatory deals too. You know, there's a lot to think about there. It's uh, it's not that simple of an answer in my opinion. Uh, down, down sample and bit crush are the coolest forms of distortion. I mean, it really depends on the context, but sometimes I think it fucking sucks. I've heard contexts where I'm like, yeah, good, good thinking. I've heard other contexts where I'm like, 
What are you thinking? Uh, Fuji says, hot take, royalty-free loops are a scam. They're royalty-free until you get a placement, then they switch it up on you. I have not actually ran into this problem before, but I could definitely see this being a thing. Uh, you gotta make sure that it says it in some sort of writing, I guess, before you get a placement. <laughs> All right, Tesco Meal Deal says, splice is kill drum slash loop packs. I mean, why don't you just put them on splice? That's, that's kind of what's going on, right? I feel like if you have a platform too, it shouldn't really matter too much. All right, zero spin. Okay, first, oh my God. He says he's not a native English speaker and he's kind of drunk. Um, God, there's a lot of, in the future, can you guys just write one thing? Cause there's like three things in a lot of these and I don't want to just ignore people, but at the same time, this, this is going to have to be multiple videos for sure. Okay, ooh, he's got some juicy ones here, I think. Okay, music production has become so popular now that most people consuming content about and most important buying products related to it don't know a lot about it and that has made scamming a way more viable strategy. From chord packs to crappy romplers, cheap sounding multi effects plugins, etc. a lot of money can be made exploiting unexperienced producers with fairly affordable products that are low in price but even lower in value. I, I really agree with this because you can use your platform to sell people some trash. We've seen that in the past and I think we're gonna see a lot more of it in the future. I think a massive red flag is someone selling a product that already exists. It's one thing to make a free plugin, but if you're making a product that already exists and charging money for it, and um, it's not really bringing anything new to the table, then beware for sure. I don't really know how to fix this problem, but it's definitely an issue. I do agree with that. And then he writes, related to the first point, but less important is that YouTube is filled with people making tutorials full of bad info clickbait titles and the same tips some of them are literally stuff like do this so it goes harder over and over again and this makes me mad because i'm really dumb so i fall for clickbait time and time again <laughs> not, not talking about this channel by the way ah uh, thank you i do clickbait a little bit though i wouldn't say clickbait but sometimes when it's not getting enough clicks i'll be like okay we got to make this title a little more intriguing there's definitely a lot of shitty tips on YouTube because anyone can get on and record a video nowadays. You know, sometimes people that have just started do have some good tips, but if they can't explain why what they're doing or explaining is important or useful, then they probably shouldn't be doing it in my opinion. Also the fact that you can get monetized and, um, you know, you can get paid for shitty videos essentially. And the fact that like any sort of engagement is good engagement can kind of lead these bad videos to rise to the top still. So I guess like the best thing you could do is like when this happens, um, stop watching the video immediately. Don't even, I mean, you can leave a dislike, but you should like try to leave as minimal engagement as possible. The dislike button is still a useful feature in my opinion, because it can signify bad, bad information. So definitely get the return dislike tool if you haven't gotten that. I like this one. Most of us are never going to make it get signed or anything and that's not bad but I guess may it may be a hot take for some people you should never stop trying though yeah I agree with that well part of the thing is like you gotta if you don't have a lot of drive then you're definitely never gonna make it because you either got to get lucky or you got to have a lot of drive so if you don't have those two things then I don't know it's gonna be rough smelly mala right FL studio just doesn't sound right after you have paid for it I I agree although I'm an Ableton user so I wouldn't really know but I paid for it. I don't know why I said it like that. Uh, I did actually pay for my Ableton. I feel like after you've been using a software for a long enough time and you've made money off of it, I think you are kind of obligated to pay for it. Analog Lab is better than Omnisphere in 2022. I haven't sat down with uh, Analog Lab 5 as much as I'd like to. Omnisphere is all right, but yeah, I do kind of agree that Analog Lab is better. It has a lot higher quality control. Analog Lab actually goes through Arteria's best synth emulations and like pulls out the best presets or at least what they deem to be the best presets. So yeah, naturally it would be better. Mr. Ouija writes, hopefully I'm saying that right. NPCs and most other samplers are just weak and expensive computers or rubber pads. I do sort of agree with this, but I think it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about hardware. It's really about workflow and how you like to work and what you deem fun and entertaining or interesting. While you could say, yeah, this is like not quite a computer or it's a shitty computer, some people do prefer to work that way. Like it's not gonna give you a specific sound other than the limitations of it might give you a specific sound. I also think it's kind of dumb when people say, oh yeah, the Ableton sound or the FL Studio sound. It's like, yeah, the only thing dictating those sounds is what's in it and the way you use it because of the the way the software is set up like there's no there's no fl studio sound cassidy says stealing compositions from stuff ain't that bad it depends what you mean i guess um you're talking about sampling you're talking about recalibrating a composition remixing i don't know i don't even know how to respond to that one at a certain point though if you're just copy and pasting someone else's shit then like i guess it's kind of you know it is kind of just 
stealing at that point. There's definitely creative ways to do it and uncreative ways to do it. Produced by Little Booger writes, <laughs> do I like that name, Little Booger? <laughs> Little Booger writes, just copy and paste the same beat over different melodies. Isn't that what people are doing already? But no, I feel like a lot of the beats that get placements usually have like really simple hi-hat patterns and um, the beat does sound kind of the same often. So that's actually, I might not actually be a bad strategy. All right, Haunted writes, make good music. That's a, ooh, that's a hot one there. I don't know if I can agree with that one. I don't know. I'd maybe focus more on the mixing like that other guy said. <laughs> All right, Eric Stillwall writes, NFT VSTs are coming and it will be the next big thing to subscriptions. God, I hope not. I kind of, I feel like this one has to be a troll because there's flame emojis and no one would be hyped about uh, NFTs and subscriptions and VSTs. So this has got, yeah, I, I got troll. I got trolled guys. And Lucid Jason writes, Pro Tools is not the best DAW. And frankly, there is no best DAW. It's the genius behind it. So yeah, Pro Tools is obviously not the best DAW, especially if we follow your logic here. You know, I feel like with the best DAW is whatever you feel comfortable with. And yeah, obviously the, it's the genius behind it too. Uh, I'm a motherfucking, motherfucking genius. genius. I do think Pro Tools is kind of uh, overvalued in the industry though. I do, I do agree with that for sure. All right, Cosmic Prank says, just let Ozone master it, bro. Don't be a nerd about it. I'm gonna be a nerd about it if I want to. In fact, I'm gonna say a bunch of numbers right now. In a way, that's kind of true because um, Ozone and all these other mastering services or whatever you want to talk about, they do a decent job, especially if you're only trying to get to negative 14 LUFS. But if you're trying to get it really loud, then you're gonna, it's gonna require a lot of nuance. But at some point we may not need that anymore because literally the only services that don't normalize are SoundCloud, um, CDs, which no one really uses anymore. And then like DJs usually use like a loud version too. Like I said, I'm gonna be a nerd about it. Okay, this is the last one for now. Ghost Healer writes, trap and drill beats are boring, overdone, and unimaginative. You know, I feel like all beats can kind of be boring and unimaginative at a certain point, especially if, if they're within a certain genre and only one genre specifically. But the fact that trap and drill have been kind of been at the top for a while now is probably why you feel that way. I feel like if you just listen to any beat though, it'll be boring and unimaginative at a certain point. I think what makes songs a lot more interesting is actually vocals. I mean, not that every song needs vocals, but if it doesn't have vocals, then there's not like a whole lot of tangible things to relate to about it, you know? But I mean, you, you can really say the same thing about like a boom bap beat, a progressive boom bap beat, a house beat, a trance beat. All right, that's it for um, music production hot takes. I'm still trying to figure out a name for this series. So if you guys got any sort of name ideas, uh, let me know down in the comments. If you guys want to submit your hot takes to the next video, uh, follow me on Twitter or Instagram and I'll be posting it on there. Uh, there's gonna be a part two to this video still, but uh, yeah, I still got like 20 more of these to go through here. So I'm gonna just do that in the next video. Make sure to check out my second channel, Discord, Twitch, Patreon, affiliate links if you wanna support the channel. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye. I just wanna drill your cheeks.